the book of Job. It's on page 417 in your few Bibles there. If you turn that up, we're going to read the first five verses in chapter 1 of Job. Page 417. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Pray the Lord will bless that reading to our hearts as the Craig brings the message, message now. There we go. It's the voice from up here. Woo. <laughs> Let's pray and we'll come to this book. Father, we ask that you would guide us. We thank you for the book of Job. It speaks to an issue that touches every one of us. But it is a difficult book. And we ask for your wisdom, and I ask personally that you would help me to understand it, and more than that, to share these truths. Thank you for each one here this morning, and ask that you would give us ears to hear, teach us what you would have us learn from this tremendous book, in Christ's name, Amen. Job. Job's one of the more interesting but perplexing books in the Bible. I'm not sure whether you've heard many sermons on Job. Chances are you haven't heard too many sermons on Job. It is a hard book to preach. Unfortunately for you guys, it's a hard book to listen to. It's also a hard book to understand. A few fellow pastors, when I told them I was going to be preaching through Job, they kind of raised an eyebrow and said, Really? Job? So why am I preaching through Job? Two reasons. Firstly, as an apology to Grace Bible Church. What do I mean by that? Over the years, a number of you have had suffering and pain in your life and you've come and you've wanted counsel. Now, I don't know if you've ever had anybody that's really hurting come to you, but oftentimes it's really hard to know what to say. And in retrospect, often the counsel I gave was quite superficial, inadequate, and poor. Of my advice was more akin to what Job's three friends said to him. And I've got a little different perspective now. For over 50 years, almost no suffering in my life. Last couple of years, God's blessed me with a few trials. Uh, health in some members of my family, health personally, ministry. And I had to tell you, superficial pat answers did almost nothing for me. I had to work through a theology of suffering. And this series on Job is what I wish I had told you all those years ago. Secondly, I want to preach through Job because it is, it is a crucial book for understanding life in this messed up, fallen world. I look out here this morning and there are saints sitting right here, beloved saints who have suffered greatly. Some who are suffering greatly right now. I know there are people out there that have had real problems in their marriage. Some of you have problems with your children. Some of you have had children born with terrible uh, struggles. Others have had cancer or chronic disease. Some of you have been betrayed by very close friends. Some of you have had crippling financial losses. Some of you have held the hand of people taken far too early. What the elders did when we were preparing this series is we sat down and we said, we'd like some testimonies from people in the church that have struggled. And so we sat down and we came with a list. I was amazed how long that list was 
and how severe the suffering many of you went through. We trimmed our list down to just over a dozen names and I wrote to them and said, would you be willing to share? Now, what surprised me, but in retrospect should never have surprised me, was that over two thirds said thank you, but no thank you. It's still too raw, I can't share what's been going on. Suffering's never easy, even for mature godly saints. Now, if you're sitting out there and you're going, oh, Job, suffering, no. Well, you're just too young. <laughs> if you live long enough, suffering comes to us all. And Job helps us get ready. And if the suffering's intense enough, you're going to do what Job does, and you are going to ask God why. The great why question. Why am I hurting if you love me? Why haven't you taken this pain away? Why haven't you fixed my problem? Why me? Now the whys are often big ones. God, why did I get cancer? But there are more routine ones that we ask all the time. God, why did my car have to break down when I'm broke? God, why, why is it that my daughter just seems to hate me and I can't seem to relate to her? Why is the searing question Job asks again and again? Just this week, those of you who are on the email list of our missionary Thomas who serves in Central Asia would have got his update, and if you read through that update, you would have read this. The son of his translator tragically died. And Thomas wrote this. All this, of course, leads to the big why questions. Why did this happen? Why did the little boy get sick? Why did God allow him to die? It's not just our translator's son. We all know of tragic deaths. Why doesn't God stop these things from happening? So many questions that can rock us and challenge our faith. Thomas continues, This is why I believe God gave us the book of Job. When I was a young Christian, before I'd really seen much tragedy in life, I read the book of Job and really didn't get it. I mean, why did it have to be 42 long chapters? It just didn't seem to go anywhere. It was just Job talking in circles, his friends talking in circles, and in the end, God didn't even tell Job why he'd been suffering so much. But now that I'm older, now that I've seen tragedy and deep, unexplainable sadness, I understand the book of Job better. Job had questions, deep questions, that rocked him to the core. And God did eventually answer him, but not in the way he expected. May God give us all faith to trust him totally, even when tragedies like this just don't seem to make sense. We're all going to have the why questions. And I've come to believe, as Thomas did, that the answers lie in a different direction than needing to know the answers to why. Let me put it another way. I believe the real question in Job is not why, the real question is who. Job keeps asking why, you get to the end of the book and God does not tell him why. Instead, what you find throughout this book is that there are hints and there are allusions and there are pictures that are who's going to come. That someone is going to come who can do what Job really needs and deal with suffering. See, God's not passive. He has a plan to act. And he is dealing with the pain Job and every one of us faces. So if you want to summarise the book of Job, here's how I believe you can summarise it. The great question is not, why am I suffering? What's the great question? Who can end the suffering? So with this in mind, Job shows us three things. First of all, suffering often comes without a why in us. And you go, funny sentence. What does it mean? See, when suffering strikes, most of us have a reflex, and our reflex is to cry out, why? Why, God? What have I done to deserve this? Now, what we actually are after, we want a simple answer and a simple solution to end the pain. We look for a why in us. Okay. I got cancer, and I have been cheating on my wife, that's the reason, so if I get my marriage right, God will heal me. What we're going to see in Job, in the verses we're going to look at a little later this morning, is 
There's no reason in Job. There is no secret sin. There is nothing in Job that's going to cause the calamity that's about to come on him. In chapter 2, verse 3, God says to Satan, You incited me against Job to destroy him without reason. Now, God had his reasons. What God's saying is, there is no reason in Job for what happened. Most of the time there is no reason, no why in our lives. No area of sin that directly relates to the suffering. Now, we'll see a little later. Sometimes there is, but most of the time there isn't. Job tells us that most often suffering has no correlation with the problem in our lives. Don't assume that you have done something to cause tragedy when it comes into your life. And don't let others guilt you in a looking for some sin, some reason in your life. Secondly, we couldn't understand the why of suffering even if God told us. At the end of this book, you see, God appear out of the world and he says, Job, you keep asking why. You really want to know the why? Job, it's like this. You could not understand the basic things, like how I created this universe. So there is absolutely no way you could understand the complex things, like how I work all things together. Now God has his reasons. Next week we're going to see a glimpse into his sovereign purposes, but it's only a glimpse. We couldn't understand the whys if God told them to us. But thirdly, what we really need is not an answer to the why of suffering, but a who to end suffering. This book ends, and Job does not get an answer to the why, but he doesn't need it. See, you get cancer, you go to the doctor, you might ask, Doc, why did I get this? Why me? I might go, really? Do we really want to know? Look, do you really want to know the current theory of why genetic instability and environmental stimulus leads to disorders of cellular degeneration? Or do you just want to know what we're going to do to cure you? Most of us say, yeah, actually I really want the cure over the explanation. So you keep these points at the back of your mind as we work through Job. When suffering strikes, our reflex is to say why, but what you really need is a who, someone who will end the suffering. The book of Job is a powerful book. It is very powerful because it deals with the most profound realities in this life. Shakespeare, you can never get better than Shakespeare except the Bible. Shakespeare put it this way in Macbeth. Each new morn, new widow's howl, new orphan's cry, new sorrow strike heaven on the face. There is not a day in which someone in this city, let alone this world, suffers the most profound trials and pain. Job, Job helps us get through when that comes to us. Now theologians and pastors have debated what the point of Job is for centuries. During my long service, read a number of books on Job and suffering. Now quite a number of the better scholars, the better pastors said, what Job teaches us is something like this. Job, teaching the people of God that our suffering is not as important as the glory of God. See, what they're saying is, it's not that your suffering is unimportant, it's just that the glory of God is more important. Now, it kind of looks right. Those of us that have a high view of God go, yeah. But I didn't really like it, it just didn't sit well. I would look at this and it makes me feel like a pawn in a game moved about by an uncaring God. It's almost as if God's saying, you know what, it's okay if Craig Lloyd suffers, as long as God ultimately gets glorified. So Craig, you just suck it up and stick in there for the kingdom. Others suggested that what Job taught about suffering is this. Job, teaching the people of God that the Lord is sovereign, even over suffering and uses it for our good and for his glory. God is sovereign over everything. He's sovereign over Satan, he's sovereign over suffering, and he works all things, even this, for good. Again, it looks right. But the message is, just put up with it. God will one day sort it out, either in this life or in the life to come. And I looked at these statements. These are both absolutely true. And they are vitally important. And you know what? They are definitely themes found throughout Job. But finally I realised what just didn't sit right with me. 
If Job wasn't in my Bible, I would still know these things. You would still know these things. But even worse, I look at these and they do not tell me how to endure when suffering comes and touches me. So my problem was I, not that I didn't know these truths. My problem was I don't know how to apply them when the scorching heat of suffering turns up. And I think this is where my previous advice to a number of you lacked. Often my response was just like this. You're suffering? Well, just remember, God's sovereign, God's great, trust God, hang in there. I didn't tell you how to do it. This is what the book of Job does, and it does it so well. So here's how I want to sum up what Job teaches us about suffering. Job teaching the people of God how to suffer, and this is the important part, through hope in Christ. Job tells us God's not passive about your suffering. God is not uncaring. He cares so much he did something about it. He heard our cries and he answered them not by telling us a why that we could never understand. He answered them by sending a who, someone who would come, who would suffer, and who would finally end suffering in this world. More than that, we're also told knowing him is where you find the strength to persevere. Basically, Job tells us the way through suffering is not by escaping it, but to trust that God has a plan, and in that plan, and in that person, to find the strength to persevere. Now, I warn you in advance, even knowing this, even if you are a theologian of Job, the day suffering comes, you're going to struggle. As soon as catastrophe comes, so much of our theology and our preparation just leaves us and we find ourselves on the ground crying, why, why me? Trials can come and they can push us away from God and they can rob us of joy. But we need to be ready. We need to be ready to put our best theological foot forward and Job does that. And it's crucial. It's crucial because you know what? Suffering doesn't always end in this life. Some do have their suffering end. Some will get cancer, they'll go through treatment and get cured, but you know what? Some won't. Some might lose their job for a number of years, but usually another one comes along. But others have injuries and illnesses where they get pain every day and there is no hope for an end to that. Job gives us hope. Job says that the day of pain How's that one? All right, let's try that. You know, Job does give us hope that the day of pain will end and it helps us to persevere. Now, before we get to the text, I want to do something. I want to talk about the flow and structure of the book and you're sitting there going, flow and structure. But there's an important point that I think this helps us with. You've probably heard that in Scripture there are different genres, different styles. And for those of us that aren't English majors, the translators of the Bibles do certain things to help us realise that there are different genres. Here is uh, Job chapter 2 and chapter 3. It's out of the ESV, but most Bibles do something very similar. Notice the end of Job 2. Job 1 and 2, it is narrative. It is a story. It's written in whole, continuous sentences. But Job 3, it changes to poetry. It's formatted in short group sentences of similar length. Now the change is so stark that even you and I should be able to get it. And the translators have made it very clear for us. So what does this mean? When we look at the entire book of Job, we find there's a prologue. It's written in narrative. Then they've got a body written in poetry and an epilogue written in narrative. How does this flesh out? 
Well, the prologue deals with the testing of godly faith. And in the body, the struggling of godly faith. And the epilogue, the blessing of godly faith. But here's what I want you to grasp. I think most of you, before I asked you to read Job, and hopefully you didn't, perhaps even after reading Job, your understanding of it might be a bit sketchy. What you probably knew about Job is the first couple of chapters. There's this guy is having a great life, and it all falls apart. And then he questions God, and you might even know that there's these three friends that turn up that are decidedly unhelpful. You may even know that a fourth person, Elihu, turns up, and he's a bit more helpful, but still not good enough. And then God appears at the end, and then finally Job's fortunes are restored. That's probably about what you know. You probably have heard sermons on the first bit of Job and the end of Job. You probably struggled to get through the middle part, but I want to tell you the middle part, in many ways, is the important part. Not only is there structure there to highlight it, but have a look at this slide. What I've done in this slide is I've shown you the relative proportions of each of these sections. The vast bulk of Job, about 95%, is this middle, hard to understand, hard to get your head around bit. But they're crucial. Let, let me ask you to think about it this way. What if all we had was Job 1 and 2 and the very end? Here's what we would have. We would have Job doing well, Job's struggling because he suffers more than any of us have ever suffered. And yet Job just stays firm. He says, shall we receive blessing from God? Shall we not receive calamity? God saying in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And then God gives Job a happy ending. We would get a message that says, when calamity comes, just stay firm and God will sort it all out. We would get a picture that Christians never lose it. We never fall to bits. We never go to really dark places. We're going to see Job absolutely lose it in chapter 3. And we're going to see him struggle to get from this really dark place back to a place of faith. And that's what we really need. In the big part of the book, Job asks some very hard questions. And what he comes to realise is there are answers. They're in different places than he was looking, but there are answers and there are great answers. When suffering comes, you're going to have the same questions as Job. It's not a simple book, but the answer's are there. I don't know where you're at today. Some of you are out there going, I'm doing great. I've got just about no trials in my life. Life is good. Some of you out there are going, man, I'm right in the middle of Job. I'm hurting. We're all going to be there at some point. And even if we don't have it personally, there are going to be why questions. But Murray talk about 9-11. In 2004, we saw a, the tsunami kill 250,000 men, women and children. And every one of us had to have asked, why? Why God? It makes no sense. And I want to tell you the day that that kind of suffering actually crosses the doorstep in your house, you are going to ask, why? And Job has answers. They're hard answers. But they're answers that have satisfied the church of God for millennia. Job corrects the shallow, man-centered, pathetic views of God and his dealings with the world that will never sustain you in those days. Well, that's a basic overview of Job. I want to end this morning by looking at the first five verses. I won't read them. Graham's read them. But here's how I want to summarise these first five verses. It's the prosperity gospel. It's how we think the world should work. You see, when we read those verses, there is something inside of us that thinks that's the way the world should work. If you're godly, you should be blessed. If you sin... You should suffer. Now, it is not just Christians who have that deep-seated belief. Every religion, every philosophy has some kind of reward and punishment ideology. In fact, even if they don't admit it, most atheists actually have it. Some of the most ardent atheists I know 
They see something bad happen to somebody and they'll say, karma, baby. Something bad happened to them because they did something bad. And if you push them and say, so you do believe in a higher power, they'll say, no, 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 I don't really. They'll say, it's just a figure of speech. They'll say, there is no God. Darwinism explains the world. But the reality is, deep down, they want to believe in karma. They want to believe that good will triumph and evil won't. Most of the famous movies that we've seen, many of them actually had much darker, more sinister endings. But what they did, they did test screenings and showed audiences, and the audiences hated those dark endings. They want Disney endings. They want happy endings. And so they redid those movies where the good guys come out on top and the bad guys get their just desserts, because that's what we want. We live in a world that does not function that way. So why do we want it to function that way? Because that's how God originally created the world. Inside each of us there are still echoes of Eden telling us, you know what, this is not the way the world should be. We do think good should triumph. We do think evil should lose. We do think good should be rewarded. We do think evil should be punished. We want the world to function according to some type of divine reward system. Now, once it did in Eden, and once it will again in heaven, but we happen to live in the time in between, and this world is messed up and doesn't function that way. Now, if you're a Christian, there is a flashing question here. I'm sure you've asked this many times. Why doesn't God just intervene right now and restore it all and make the world function like a prosperity gospel world? When you read the Bible, you know the answer. There is suffering in this world because there is sin in this world. And to get rid of the suffering in this world, you've got to get rid of the sin. And to get rid of the sin, you've got to get rid of sinners, which means getting rid of you and getting rid of me. And God said, because of grace, I have a greater plan. I'm going to deal with sin without destroying all of these sinners. And his plan is being patiently worked out. And while that plan of salvation is being worked out, this fallen world remains because sinners remain. Now remember, even though this world is messed up, echoes of Eden still remain. What do I mean? The Bible says that if you are righteous, there will be blessings. In Deuteronomy it says, if you do these things, there are blessings for obedience and cursings for disobedience. Proverbs is filled with truisms. Godly people will be blessed and ungodly will suffer. You know that if you are faithful to your wife, if you love God and work hard in general, life will be much better than if you sleep around, disobey God and just lie around on the couch. If you sin, there are often consequences. But it's not always this way. They're just truisms. And many times the world does not function this way. Now, there are teachers out there that say, Craig, you're wrong. God does always give prosperity to the righteous. If you are godly, you will get health, wealth and happiness. They want to argue that if there is suffering in your life, there is a problem in your life, go look for it. So in these first five verses, at this point in his life, Joe is the poster boy for Joel Osteen and the prosperity gospel teachers. In these five verses, we do see Job's best life now. Now, prosperity teachers, and Joel Osteen is perhaps the best known, teach that if you're godly, the Lord will bless you. Right now, in this world, you can have your best life now. You obey God, you get a great life. If you suffer, well, there's sin in your life somewhere. Job's three friends would have loved Joel Osteen. They would have been Joel Osteen fanboys, I can tell you. But fortunately for you and for me, they are wrong. They're very wrong about how God deals with us. See, prosperity teachers would say in these first five verses, Job's just getting what he deserved. Problem for them is, you know what? Job does not end at verse 5. Nor should it. Anyone with two eyes can look around this world and we see this is not a prosperity gospel world. 
If this life is the best we get, we're in trouble. Or as the great philosopher Shai Lin said, if you're living your best life now, you're heading for hell. Even the best life can go horribly wrong. Good people do suffer. Wicked people can be blessed. Prosperity is not always a sign of blessing. I would argue the persecuted church in parts of Asia and Africa are often much godlier than the prosperous churches in the West. So as much as we might want to believe otherwise, this fallen world does not always meet out rewards based on merit. What is the point? In these first five verses, we see Job. He is a godly man. And what happens from verse 6 onwards is not because there is secret sin in his life. What we learn from in today's message is the first point we looked at earlier. Suffering often comes without a why in it. As much as at times we want the world to run just like these five verses, it doesn't. The reality is, each morning, new widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven on the face. That's the reality. Suffering eventually comes to us all. And next week we'll see in verse 6, it comes to Job. Now he, he's a godly man. How godly is he? Well, look at these verses here. Job, we read, offers sacrifices on behalf of his family. We believe that that means he lived in the time before priests. We think he probably lived about the time of Abraham. We think the book was probably written somewhere around that time. He lived in Uz. We're not sure where it is. Lamentations tells us it's probably an area east of Canaan. But they're not the significant things. The significant things about Job is he's godly. Look at it. He's blameless. He's upright. He feared God. He turned away from evil. In fact, twice. Verse 8 of this chapter, verse 3 of chapter 2, God uses those very words to describe Job to Satan. Now, don't, don't get this wrong. Blameless doesn't mean sinless. Later in the book, Job says, I know I committed iniquities in my youth. The word means that when compared with other people, he's about as good as you get. He's faithful. He's godly. There's nobody else on earth like him. What does this mean? It means if the prosperity gospel is right, if there is anybody in this life who should just wander uninterrupted blessings throughout their entire life, it is Job. Now, I'm no Job, and you know what? Neither are you. So if God ever has a conversation with Satan about us, I'm pretty sure he's not going to say, have you considered my Satan pray, or Mary, or insert your own name? There is none like them on earth, blameless, upright, who fears God and turns away from evil. But God did say this about Job, and the important thing is, what happens to Job is not because of some deep sin. It is not karma. But for now, in these verses, he's having a great life. He's got ten children, seven sons, three daughters. We're told that when his children gathered on their day, perhaps their birthday, Job rose early and he offered a sacrifice, not because he knew they'd sinned, but just in case they might have sinned. That's how godly Job is. He's the greatest man in the East. It means he's the wealthiest. He's the most powerful man. He is basically a king in the days before kings. Look at what he's got. 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, very many servants. It's an incredible display of wealth. In these days, wealth is determined by what you got. If you had one camel, one ox, ten sheep, you were in the higher wealth bracket. Job's very wealthy. A little later in Job 29, Job's thinking back to these days, and this is what he says. When I went out to the gate of the city, when I prepared my seat in the square, the young men saw me and withdrew. The aged rose and stood. The princes refrained from taking, from talking and laid their hand on their mouth. The voice of the nobles was hushed. Their tongue stuck to the root of their mouth. When the ear heard it, it called me blessed. And when the eye saw it, it approved. When Job went there, the young guys spread, went back 
The older ones stood up, the princes went silent, their mouths went dry. That's how great Job was. So life's good for Job. But it's all about the end. The point of these verses is it's not because of a secret sin. It's because God, God has a plan for Job and it involves suffering. So as we finish these first five verses, there's a question I want to ask you. Do you want to live in a world where God blesses us and punishes us according to the righteousness of our life? Do you really want to live in a prosperity gospel world? Now, you're Christians, you know the answer is no. But I want to suggest there is actually a big part of you that wants to shout out, that is exactly the word I want. We want to cry, I do not want to live in a world where Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump can become president. I want to live in a world where John Piper or Al Mola becomes president. I want to live in a world where missionaries are blessed and drug bosses end up in prison. I do want some reward for all my prayers and my offerings and my godliness and my evangelism. However, one of the purposes of Job is to show you that no, you really don't. You really, really do not want to live in that kind of world. Why? Because a prosperity gospel world has no answer to the question of sin. God did create the world that ran like a prosperity gospel world. It was called Eden, but the world fell. And because there is a good God, there are still residual echoing effects this way. The prosperity gospel is not entirely false. There are some blessings for living godly. But it is clearly not always the case. This is a fallen world. Bad things happen to good people. Missionaries take the gospel places and they are speared to death. Pastors' wives are struck down by cancer. Beloved children of believers are born with crippling defects. Men, women and children we all think deserve great blessings have terrible problems in their life. And we turn on the TV and we see criminals and deviants and they're living a life of blessed luxury. Why doesn't God orchestrate this world to always run according to the prosperity gospel? Here's why. Think about this. Do you really want to come to the end of your days? You've lived godly, you've been blessed, hallelujah, and then you die and God says, okay, so you want what you deserve. I want to tell you, unless you are far godlier than Job and have never sinned, you do not want a holy God saying, right, you want to get what you deserve. Because what you deserve is hell. And that is justice. Job and his friends and you and I need to come to understand that God's giving us something greater than a prosperity gospel world. He's given us a world in which grace reigns. We need to fall on our knees every night and we need to thank God that He's chosen grace over law. Now throughout the book of Job we're going to see signposts. And these signposts are hints that there is a Redeemer. There is an Advocate. There is a Holy One coming who will finally deal with the root cause of suffering and end it forever. But brothers and sisters, while this fallen world exists, it doesn't run as a prosperity gospel world and bad things happen. Now there are people, as I said, that deny this. One of the things that I was thinking about over the last few weeks is, I wonder what Joel Osteen says about Job. He doesn't say anything about Job. He needs to. We all need to understand Job. Because as much as some of us might want to deny it, bad things happen. And when they happen, we've got to know how to deal with them. Read those five verses again. There's no one in here as godly as Job, and yet next week we're going to see the most unimaginable tragedies come on him. I'm not sure where you're at today. I suspect a lot of people sitting here are much closer to Job in the first five verses. You married a nice guy. You married a great girl. 
you've been blessed with healthy children, you live in an awesome country, you've got steady jobs, you're at a good church, you've got nice friends, life is good. Some of you probably went, oh, I really don't want to tr- trudge through Job. Others of you are right in the middle of Job. And you're suffering and you said, bring it on, I've got to know how to deal with this. You know this, that suffering often comes without a why in it. And I want to tell you, this day will come to you. One day there'll be a car accident. One day you'll be shaven and you'll feel that lump. One day there'll be a telephone call. It does not take much to move from Job 1.5 to Job 1.6. And if things get worse, you're going to find yourself in Job 3, and that is a dark place. And you're going to be wondering, how do I get out of here? Perhaps you're here this morning and you are not a Christian. I have a question for you. How do you deal with trials and suffering and pain in your life? Frederick Nietzsche, famous atheist philosopher, made a statement about suffering that many people like. You've probably seen it on a fridge magnet or on a poster. He said this, He who has a why to live can bear almost anyhow. If you have a purpose in life, you can deal with anything. The problem is, it's patently untrue. Nietzsche himself was profoundly unhappy and struggled to deal with even minor adversities in his own life. At age 44, he had a complete breakdown and he remained incapacitated till his death at 55. His philosophy failed him miserably. But Job has a different message and it's one that stood the test of time. He who has a who to live for can bear almost any why. When we place our trust in Jesus and when we live for Him, then we don't need an answer to why, because we've got the solution. And it's enough. And so ultimately Job isn't a dark book. Ultimately Job's an incredible book of hope. It is a book that points to the Redeemer, who points to the Advocate, who points to the Holy One, who will be there with you in the valley of the shadow of death and will ultimately end all suffering. It's a book that tells us why Jesus had to come. And it's a book that says, you know what, you've got a greater hope than living a prosperous life in this world. And for these reasons, Job is a treasure and a blessing for the people of God because it gives us a who to live for. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the book of Job. Lord, this is a fallen world. And tragedies come to us all. And Lord, we have asked and will ask the why questions. And we thank you that you answered with a who, with Jesus. Pray that you would teach us these great truths. Show us the path from despair to faith. Show us how to navigate this world when dark times come on. Show us how to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And help us to remember that he will hold me fast. In Christ's name, Amen.